mission statement of fellowship says that we want to produce and release spiritual leaders who know and express the authentic Christ in Northwest Arkansas and the world. And when some of you read that or hear that, it just kind of resonates with you and say, yes, I want to be that person. That's, that's how I can see myself. I want to become that person. But in a moment of honesty, does some of you read that statement and don't see yourself in it at all? And you think to yourself, that's not me because I'm not a leader. Well, perhaps it's because the common view of leadership is someone who's up front, out front, in charge, leading the charge, the face of the organization, the one everyone is looking to. And the reality is most of us are not that person. Isn't that right? So if you're not that person and you have trouble seeing yourself in our mission statement, good news, this message is for you. So what do you think when you see this? A maturing follower of Jesus with a ministry focus of life. Does that resonate with you? Are you able to read that and go, I could be that. I could be a follower of Jesus who's just growing in my faith, who's just maturing in my faith day by day, trying to go deeper in my relationship with the Lord, trying to grow more like him just a little bit every day. I could be a person who tries to live life with a ministry focus and start looking out to see ways that I might have an impact for Christ in the way that I live. Well, when we talk about spiritual leaders, that's what we mean. Our whole ministry is focused on seeing people become faithful followers of Jesus who are every day learning to love him and become a little more like him. And that's all it is that we're trying to do. In fact, the heart of what we hope for in fellowship is captured in another saying that you may have heard us say, names nowhere, fingerprints everywhere. You know, it's been said that it's, it is amazing how much can get done if no one cares who gets the credit. I'm thinking of Washington, D.C. right now. Okay, not thinking about Washington, D.C. anymore. Anyway, that's not our culture, is it? Being a helper, being an assistant, being someone who's behind the scenes and never gets noticed just is not celebrated very much. Let's be honest, as parents, that's not, kind of, that's not really the dream we have for most of our kids. If, if we, want, we want our kids to, to be recognized, and we want them to, to be celebrated. And we know in our culture, helpers aren't celebrated. There's a song by Casting Crowns that has this line. It has a couple of lines I want to share with you. I'm not going to sing. Relax. Okay. But the first line I want to share with you, it says, because I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. And then a little later it says, and if they all forget my name, well, that's fine with me. I'm living for the world to see nobody but Jesus. And that's who God has called us to be. People who are a reflection to the world of what Jesus is like. People who in the way we live, the way we love, the way we act, the way we interact, we are reflecting to the world the Jesus that has made the difference in our lives. And we can all do that. And we can all be that. This morning, we're going to look at the examples of two people that I think every one of us can relate to. In fact, one writer commenting on this passage said it was as if Paul was writing chapter 2 of Philippians and he writes about, uh, be, you know, let this mind be in you, which is, like, which is in Christ, and, and take on the example of Christ. And then he looks around him and goes, oh, and by the way, I've got two guys right here who live that out every day. Let me tell you about them. I'm, I've got these guys who, who are living what I'm talking about, and they're not part of the who's who in the Bible. In fact, they're more part of the who's that of the Bible. 
They're not well known. One of them you know better than the other, but neither one of them is not really well known. They're not famous for anything. They didn't do anything really big that we celebrate. But from their examples, I want us to learn and to see that following Jesus is not about being good or being great. It's mostly about being faithful and available. Just ordinary people who say yes to Jesus. So the first example we see is is Timothy. And in verse 19 of Philippians 2, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him, he says, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send with him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. We meet Timothy in the book of Acts chapter 16. That's the first first place we encounter him. And in that chapter, we read about how he becomes one of the group that is traveling around with Paul as he goes around in different places and preaches the good news of Jesus, tells other people about Jesus. And Timothy joins that group. And he travels with him on his journey. So here's what we know about Timothy. He was from Lystra. He had a Greek father and a Jewish mother. He was part of three generations who came came to faith in Jesus, his grandmother, his mother, and Timothy. And they probably did so the first time that Paul visited Lystra and preached the gospel. He became a regular and close companion of Paul. In fact, Paul refers to him a couple of times as being his son in the faith. The very last letter that we have that Paul ever wrote that we know of was the letter of 2 Timothy. It was a letter to Timothy where he says, oh, by the way, I need you to come. Come see me. I need you to come be with me. But perhaps, I I think, perhaps the the most telling thing we know about Timothy is in Acts chapter 9 where he is described simply as one of Paul's helpers. Pardon me, Acts chapter 19, uh, where he's described as one of Paul's helpers. And again, we don't celebrate helpers, do we? Not in our culture. But look what Paul says about Timothy to the Philippians. Two things stand out to me. Number one, his love, and number two, his loyalty. Paul says, I'm sending Timothy because no one else cares about the Philippian church like he does. In fact, the words he uses, he describes that love by saying he's genuinely concerned for your welfare. Timothy is thinking about you, church. Timothy has you on his mind and on his heart. He is concerned, genuinely concerned for your welfare. Now, let me give you the context and remind you of the context of what's going on. Timothy is with Paul. Paul is in prison. He's awaiting the outcome of his trial. There is a possibility this, that things are so serious. There is a possibility Paul could be executed. He talks about, in, about that in chapter 1. He says, I don't think I will be. I'm pretty certain I'm going to be released. But there's the reality that I might be executed. So I would assume that Timothy would be concerned about the welfare of Paul. That he would be worried about how is Paul doing and what's going to happen with Paul. Maybe even concerned about his own welfare because of his close connection to Paul. But in the midst of those circumstances, we read Paul say, Timothy is thinking about you guys. He's concerned about your welfare. He's wondering, how are you doing? On Timothy's heart, he was thinking about the church at Philippi saying, are they okay? Are they struggling? Are they suffering? Do they need encouragement? Do they need help? He was genuinely concerned. He loved these people at Philippi. 
I'm reminded of a dear saint in the first church I, I served after I got out of college. Um, I was inexperienced, young, and in over my head. I felt like every day for about a year, I just spent all my time trying not to die. You guys ever felt that way? I mean, that's just what I felt like for, for the first year of my ministry there. And in that church, there was a lady whose name was Lois, which, by the way, was Timothy's grandmother's name. I think there's probably a common character trait going on here. But Lois had rheumatoid arthritis and was barely able to walk. She spent most of her days in pain in bed. And she told me once, she said, I don't feel like I could do much to serve the Lord except pray. And so by her bedside table, on her bedside table, she had a, a list of names of people that she prayed for every day, off and on, all day long. Most of those people never knew they were prayed for daily. Most of those people never knew they were lifted before our Lord and Savior daily. If anybody in our church family, if anybody in our community had a specific issue or need that would come up, Ms. Lois would write it down on her list, and she took those to the Lord daily. And then it would seem that just when I needed it most, my phone would ring, I'd be a, get a call from Ms. Lois. And here's how it would go. Brother Doug, it was a Baptist church. That's what you call your pastor. She was 50 years my senior, and yet she called me Brother Doug. Brother Doug, this is Lois. I just wanted to call and say I'm praying for you, and I love you. And then she'd hang up. Or I could say a word, she would hang up. Which is fine because I usually had a lump in my throat and couldn't have, couldn't have spoken anyway because it just overwhelmed me that she genuinely cared for my soul. She loved me. She cared about me, and she let me know it just when I needed to know it. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about Timothy's love. And so as I read about Timothy, I'm challenged to think, how might I love someone like that? How might I learn to care about someone like that? Is there someone who could use my prayers? Is there someone who could use a word of encouragement from me? Is there someone who needs a listening ear? Is there someone who's struggling, who's suffering, who needs help that I can provide? How could I learn to love and be genuinely concerned for the welfare of others? like Timothy was. And the second thing that, that stands out to me about Timothy is his loyalty to Paul and to the ministry. And it shows up in verse 22, where Paul says, you know Timothy's proven worth. You know. He has lived it out in front of you. You know how much he's worth to me and to you. You know how much he's worth to me and to the ministry of the gospel. And he goes on to say this, how that as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. And notice that he didn't say as a son to a father. He served me as I served in the gospel. Timothy did serve Paul. He did care for Paul. He did come alongside Paul and meet his needs when he could. But that's not how Paul described it. Paul said, he served with me, beside me, as my equal. Now, again, like I said, we don't really celebrate helpers in our culture. But Paul is saying, listen, my helper is my equal. My Timothy is not someone who is lesser or behind me. My Timothy is beside me. He is as essential to the ministry as I am. Now, get that. The Apostle Paul, who wrote all of these books in the New Testament, who traveled and preached the gospel in all of these cities, 
and, and planted these churches is saying, and this guy, he's essential to me and to the ministry that God has called me to. We never talk about Timothy's missionary journeys. If your Bible has maps in the back, you do not have any maps of the missionary journeys of Timothy in the back of your Bible. You might want to create some. That'd be fun. Because Timothy was on almost all of Paul's missionary journeys, and actually a few of his own, as Paul would send him here or send him there. Most of the times we read in the Bible about Timothy where he's mentioned, most of those times he's being mentioned as have been given an assignment by Paul to do this or to do that. Six times Timothy is mentioned in the greetings of one of Paul's letters as, as being with him and kind of participating with him uh, in, in sending these letters out. But we don't have anything that Timothy ever wrote himself. History tells us that Timothy died as the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And if you read particularly the letter of 1 Timothy, you realize he was there because Paul sent him there. And he stayed there until he died. His loyalty speaks to me of someone who is faithful, dedicated, enduring to the end. If you ask any, any good leader who's really honest, they will tell you that one of the keys to great leadership and successful leadership is surrounding yourself by people who are better than you are. Many of my helpers throughout the years have been my betters. When we see people on this platform teaching or, or leading in worship, you need to understand there may be a hundred people behind the scenes that worked to make this happen. That you may never hear their names mentioned, but it is essential. There was a great evangelist uh, in the early 1900s named Dwight Moody. Dwight Moody would tell you that the most influential person in all of his ministry, and he literally traveled the world and preached the gospel and saw thousands and thousands, maybe millions come to Christ. And he would tell you the most influential person in his ministry is the shoe salesman who taught a little boy's Sunday school class and shared the gospel with Dwight Moody. When I look at Timothy's love and loyalty, I wonder how I might develop those as well. And I think we find the source of those in verse 21. And it's kind of hidden because it sounds like Paul is talking about other people, but his point is trying to point is trying to make clear what Timothy's heart is like. So in verse 21, he says, in verse 20, he said, uh, I don't have anyone who's like Timothy. And then he goes to verse 21, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And his point is this, the focus of Timothy's heart were the things of Jesus. And that's where he learned to love like that. And that's where he learned and developed that loyalty and that commitment to faithful, enduring service is because he focused on the things of Jesus. When we focus on Jesus and not on ourselves, we'll then find ourselves becoming more like him. His character will start showing up in us We'll start loving like Jesus, and we'll start living like Jesus, and people will start seeing Jesus and getting to know Jesus because of us. The second example we have um, is Epaphroditus. We don't know much about him. Not even sure if I'm saying his name right. Probably not, and I may say it differently somewhere along the way, so that's okay. In fact, if Paul had not mentioned Epaphroditus in this letter to the Philippians, we wouldn't know anything about him at all. Here's what we do know. He was from Philippi. He was sent by the church there to help Paul and bring him some money. 
And then no other mention of him is found in the Bible or in church history anywhere. So all that we know about him is found in this one little letter. But look at how Paul describes him. Relatively obscure, maybe just a nobody. And Paul says in verse 25, he's my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier. Now listen, when Paul calls you that, that means something. He's my brother. He is my fellow worker. He's right in the trenches with me. He's my fellow soldier. We're doing battle. Now remember, the battle that Paul did was spiritual battle. And we're doing battle with the evil forces together. He's fighting alongside me. He was important. He was significant. And he was valuable in Paul's life. And Paul wanted these guys to know it. And maybe he makes such a big deal out of him because he might not have been a big deal to the church at Philippi. But Paul wanted to make sure they knew what a big deal he was. So then he goes on to say, and he's not only valuable to me, he's valuable to you because he is your messenger and your minister to my need. He's doing your work for me. He's valuable to you. He is representing you well. Here is a man who faithfully did what was asked of him. The church wanted to bless Paul with a financial gift, and they needed someone to carry it, to take it to him from Philippi to wherever he was. And and they felt like they needed somebody to do that, so they asked Epaphroditus, and he said, yes, I'll do that. They felt like they needed to do more, which is what he's talking about in in verse 30 when he said that uh, he, he risked his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Paul's not complaining about their lack. What he's saying, to complete what you wanted to make up. You wanted more than just his financial gift, so you sent Epaphroditus to be my servant. So they, they asked Epaphroditus, would you go when you, when you get there? Would you just stay there? And would you take care of Paul, whatever he needs? Would you just serve him? And Epaphroditus said, yes. Here's a faithful man who faithfully did what was asked of him. When I was in junior high, I was part of a small country church where we didn't have a formal youth program. But we had had this season where we had several teens in our church, and a man named Bobby saw the need, felt called of God to do something about that need, and He stepped into this opportunity to help us grow deeper in our relationship with Christ. Now, Bobby had been blessed by a ministry when he was in the Air Force, a ministry called the Navigators. And so he just brought the stuff that he learned from the Navigators, and he began, there were about six or eight of us uh, that that would meet. I was a seventh grader at the time we started, and uh, I think our oldest was may have been a senior in high school. But we just began to meet with Bobby every week, and he brought this stuff, and he taught us how to study the Word of God. And he taught us how to pray. And he taught us how to share our faith. And most of the scripture I can quote from memory today, I learned under Bobby's teaching. Out of that six or eight folks that were part of that group on a regular basis, three of us have lived lives directly connected to vocational ministry. And all the rest have walked faithfully with the Lord all their adult lives, so far as I've known. Here's a man who wasn't celebrated, wasn't a big deal in the church, wasn't a big deal in the community, saw a need, and faithfully just said yes when God called him. And he had an impact. But there's an interesting addendum to Epaphroditus' story. Apparently, at some point, Either on the way to Paul or after he arrived, Epaphroditus got sick and nearly died. This had such an impact on Paul that he instructed the church, when he's, I'm going to send Epaphroditus back to you. I know you're worried about him. He's worried about you. I'm going to send him back to you. Even though he's in 
incredibly important to me. I want to to send him back to you. And when he gets there, you honor him. Now, he doesn't say these words, but kind of the meaning behind the word is you might want to give him a parade because he's a hero. This is a guy that deserves to be acknowledged for what he's done. He risked his life to carry out the task he was given. Think about that. He risked his life to carry out the task he was given. This same description was given in the uh, first or second century after the church had begun to kind of expand. There was a, uh, an infectious disease, probably something like a plague that had, got, had kind of gone through some of the cities. And the Christians in those cities would go and take care of the sick. And they would gather up the bodies of those who had died and they would bury them at great risk to their own health. And these very words that that Paul uses to describe Epaphroditus are used to describe those people. At risk to themselves, they serve. The the, the example of Epaphroditus challenges me to ask, how willing am, am I to say yes to Jesus? What about when the task is inconvenient? What about when it's not very glamorous or interesting? What about when it requires serving rather than being served? What about when it costs me something? What about when it might cost me everything? How willing am I to say yes to Jesus? So you see, following Jesus isn't about being good or being great. It's mostly about being faithful and available. Just ordinary people who say yes to Jesus. And for the last couple of years, we've had a group of folks like that who've gone to the Amazon to serve with a mission to take the gospel to villages along the river. And they do all kinds of things. Um, provide, help provide dental care, help people get glasses. They bring food. Women hang out with the women and talk about life and paint their nails. Uh, They play with babies and children. They hang out with men in the village and talk about their lives. And in all of that, in all of that ordinariness, they share the gospel in word and deed. I've asked a couple of the uh, folks from that trip to come and talk a little bit about it. Uh, Brian Johnson and Gina Sego. on over closer. There we go. Okay. All right. So, Brian, the line that I used uh, about ordinary people who are willing to say yes to Jesus, I stole that from you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm giving credit. Okay. Uh, I stole that from you from a conversation that you and I had about this trip. So, talk to us more about what do you mean by that? Thanks, Doug. And welcome, church. My name is Brian Johnson. I'm just an ordinary supply chain nerd. I'm a member of this church. And, but over the years, I've been able to lead groups down to the Amazon River and, uh, and because of that, I've been able to go up to just regular people and ask them, hey, would you consider going to the Amazon? We load this boat, everybody see the boat in the background there? And we go down and serve these beautiful vill- people that live on the village. And when I look at this picture, though, what I see is just really ordinary members from our congregation. I see teachers and retired people and bankers and stay-at-home moms that all just said, hey, I'll say yes to Jesus and go and I'll serve and see what God has in store for me. And one of the people I got to do that with is my good friend, Gina Sego. And how did it go for you? Yeah, so Brian in 2018 asked me if I would be willing to go on this trip, on sleep on this boat, and go down the Amazon River. And I was like, what do I have to offer? I am a wife, a mom, a businesswoman. I don't know what I could possibly do on this trip. And he said, he reminded me that God always uses ordinary people to accomplish his work. And so I just said, yes, I go, and I did. And as you can see, there's lots of different things that anyone can do. I've gotten to work with uh, people who need reading glasses and help them get the right prescription vision on that so they can see again to read. I've been able to play with kids at VBS and do crafts and things like that with them. We've been able to hand out medicine to people who've seen the doctor and make them feel better. And so there's something that everyone can do. Anyone can do these, these jobs. 
And uh, one of the favorite things that we do is we have men's ministry and women's ministry. And when we do that, we break up the men and women and we share with them about our lives. And it's interesting to me that the people of Brazil think that we in the United States have it all together and that we live perfect lives. And as you guys know, that's not the case. And so when we share the truth about our own struggles, how we struggle with marriage, how we have addictions, how we uh, have health issues and financial issues and just raising our children and the struggles that we have with that, they can identify with that because those are the exact same struggles that they have in those villages in the Amazon River, Brazil. And so it really all comes down to the fact that we come, come together and we realize that we all are in need of a savior. And so, Brian, I would love for you to share with these ordinary folks a way that they have an opportunity to say yes. So we're getting ready to go to spring break uh, next year. Uh, with another group right here from the congregation. So if you have a perfect life, I'm not asking you to join. But if you feel like you have an ordinary or just a messy life, the people in the village would love to hear how God has worked in your life that will impact their their heart for the gospel. So we have a booth out back, Doug. Uh, In the booth, we'll have people that have gone from here before stop by, learn about what we're doing. We'll be here this week and next week. But man, I encourage you guys, come See what God's doing around the world. I promise you'll have a great experience. And uh, the boat is actually really nice. And the sunsets are unbelievable. And it's a little warmer than it is here today. Yes, it is. Thank you, guys. Hey, would you guys stand with me, please, for as we do a benediction prayer? And let me just challenge, and challenge you to uh, consider what, what might it be like if you were to pray this prayer at the beginning of every day of this week? Okay? So pray this prayer with me out loud. Father, help me to live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help me to give myself away to others, being kind to everyone I meet. Spirit, help me to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all I do and say. Amen. Hey, if you need prayer, we've got a team over here that would love to pray with you, pray for you. God bless you, fellowship. Have a good week.